We've all heard about uh, embryonic stem cells, it's very much in the news, but there have been other stem cells that have been known for 20, 40 years. Uh, these are the stem cells that are present, for example, in the bone marrow. In a mouse, for example, even one of these stem cells is sufficient to repopulate the bone marrow in that mouse and get it over a genetic problem. So uh, there is a good uh, future for uh, hoping to get bone marrow from an individual who has a genetic problem. Uh, as long as it's one that is approachable from the bone marrow, one can hope that to correct uh, a gene in the bone marrow and help that person. Uh, then you go to the more, tr de uh, more uh, controversial parts of this, and that's what about stem cells that come from embryos? And we have in the United States what I call foolish uh, decisions have been made about uh, the propriety of using stem cells isolated from embryos that otherwise would be destroyed. Because in vitro fertilization is a common procedure in almost all of advanced societies and there are more embryos made than are ever used for generating uh, a baby that is wanted in a family. What a shame to destroy those embryos. That's when we're killing life. It's not using them that is killing life, it's destroying them. There is a lot of breakthroughs um, um, in petto or have arrived in the last few weeks. And I think uh, making stem cells from adult cells is a, a shula. Uh, I think this is something to, to look into and uh, follow carefully. We are getting an incredible amount of information, gene sequences and expression sequences, are the genes expressed and where and how much, but information is not the same as knowledge. And I think we are far away from really understanding the interrelationships between the genes. 30,000, that's a complexity, and if you look at the proteins, it's it's an combinatorial explosion of, of the kind of combinations that you can have. And then on top of all of this, we have so many environmental factors. And I think what you refer to some of those, let's say, first attempts to make risk profiles in either sequencing, or, they are very, very early steps. And I do not, th I think it will take still a long time before our our prediction into um, disease risks and so on will become better. Maybe a more general scientific question is the correlation between genes and phenotype. Phenotype meaning the appearance of the human being. Which genes determine which features of you? And um, this is something which is the most difficult thing in, 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 gen in human genetics, I think, because people don't tell the truth. I mean, if you ask them about their lifestyle or what they eat and drink and so on, and you, you also you know yourself that many features of people do not only depend on genes, but depend a lot on, on the way they live. And if you, if, I mean, I think this is probably even more important for health uh, to maybe change lifestyles than, than, than assessing which genes you have and then, then uh, as, uh, adopting your, your, your therapy. And this, this is, is, I think, overrated uh, presently that, of course, we know that the genes are very important in determining features. Everyone has all the genes a human has, and everyone has them twice, but you have to know which allele that is the variance of the given genes cause which, which features, and this is something which is really extremely tricky. Each of us has to uh, be involved in those kind of decisions. That it is, it's not scientists, us, we shouldn't be making that decision nor should the government be making that decision. All people should be making that decision. It, that's a social question. So I think uh, one would have to leave it up to, for example, you know, the mother. She should be the foremost involved in that decision since she's going to be bearing the child. Uh, and then the parents, and then continue from that. And I think there are uh, regions where you know, more people will have to uh, enter into the decision making. Then, and that's when you ask for global decisions.
The embryo protection law says that you cannot do a pre-implantation diagnosis. That is, in in vitro fertilization, the embryos are, must be implanted into the mother be, without before one is able to to check them, not only genetically but also visually. And this is something I think is a very serious problem in Germany. It doesn't relate to eugenics or anything. It's just, I mean, not even for the mothers who have to undergo in vitro fertilization, there is enough protection for them or the best medical practice it can be done in, in, in Germany in order to <laughs> help them getting a healthy child. And I hope that the gene diagnosis, then the, the, these developments of the new law will uh, hopefully sort of start, initiate some discussion about this problem in Germany. I'm trying to understand the kidney. I'm do, uh, the things in the kidney completely different from genetics. You change with time. You do whatever at the time is becomes fascinating. That's part of science. You don't always do the same sort of work. What's happening right now, your genomes are being sequenced uh, at an enormous uh, rapidity. And also, the cost is dropping enormously. I mean, uh, just a few years ago, the human genome was sequenced, and then the mouse, and then now the horse, now the uh, <clears throat> dog, the, the cat, and so on. Uh, and so all of these sequences, one can uh, ex examine them uh, essentially in, uh, in, uh, by computers to do com uh, ana you know, comparisons and see what's conserved and what's conserved and try to make an analysis of that sequence. But what I would like to do is maybe extend what we presently have done in the mouse to all other species. Uh, and see whether it's possible now to take advantage, essentially, look at evolution as having done thousands of experiments that we would love to be able to do in the laboratory. And then if we can understand how nature has accomplished that, then we'll also now learn a lot more about ourselves. So that's the uh, way we're going, uh, what we're looking at. And uh, the way we try to, are going to do that is try to make, for example, the mouse a surrogate for a, another species on a genome-wide basis and to see whether that's practical. That is to be able to have essentially all genes of a particular species represented within the mouse and then look at all the differences between those species uh, and, the, and that way try to assess what's happening in another species. <laughs>